So Unit 1 is all about computing and morality. But one of the biggest questions normally asked is, what is morality? And so first thing I did was, I did a quick search online to get a textbook definition of what morality is. And that is principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong, or good and bad behavior. Some of the synonyms are ethics, rights and wrong, or ethical concerns. So for example, a particular system of values and principles of conduct, especially one held by a specific person or society. Uh, within the US, we have very specific social, moral skill sets. Um, but even, or not even so much skill sets, but I mean just moral uh, beliefs. If you're from the Northeast or the Southeast, you may hold very specific regional morality beliefs. Uh, same thing for Midwest, all the different subsections. While granted we all have the same general morality, the same general moral beliefs as a country, each specific region of our country, whether it be state, region, uh, town, city, our morality principles may slightly shift. So that's one of the, the concerns when we start talking about morality is morality is very contingent on uh, where you're located, what social, what cultural beliefs that there are for that specific group or individual. So those are all really big things. Another thing is which action is considered right or wrong. And again, it's very it's very specific to society, persons, and culture. Normally the question that, or the example that is used is behind all the arguments lies the issue of the morality of the possession of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons is a very touchy subject right now, but that's one of the big things. Is it right to have them? Is it wrong to have them? Because of what they are. Uh, within the U.S., another really great example, since this, we are dealing with technology, is the computer company Dell. In order for them to operate in certain countries around the world, they have to bribe government officials. Within the U.S., that's illegal. However, in certain countries, that's the standard. That, that's what they do. So, morally, is that wrong? Within the U.S., yes, we frown upon that. that. That's totally wrong. But is it wrong for them, to, for Dell to do that in countries where that is socially acceptable? Uh, early 90s, Firestone Tires, uh, when they were in uh, South Africa, they bribed both sides. They bribed rebel groups. They bribed government officials just to leave them in peace. Right or wrong? I mean, it's it's not always as simple as right or wrong. Sometimes it's situational. Sometimes it depends uh, on that specific group of people, the location. So that's one of the problems with morality. Another problem with morality is there are some, some very specific challenges. Moral responsibility, which is typically uh, classified as a human action, that also is uh, consequences. Normally, a person or group of people is morally responsible when their voluntary actions have moral significant outcome that would make it appropriate to blame or praise them. That's going to be a, a big underlining theme through our first section. Is when someone voluntarily does an action and that, out, uh, and that action leads to an outcome that's first of all significant, where we would either blame or praise them based off of their action, again, voluntarily. That way, if we force them to do it, that's not voluntary, so we can't say they're moral because we force the uh, item onto them. With the increase pervasiveness of, of computer and technologies, there's very specific challenges to figuring out what moral responsibilities entail and how should it be properly ascribed. So one of the big things for us to complain to these complicated responsibilities is we have to look at a few underlining 
challenges. Despite the ongoing philosophical debate on the issue, most of the analysis of moral responsibility has at least ver three very common conditions. The first condition, there should be a casual connection between the person and the outcome of actions. A person is usually only held responsible if he or she had control over the outcome of the event, again, voluntarily, not forced. Second, the subject has knowledge of and be able to consider the possible consequences of their actions. We intend to excuse some from blame if they could not have known that their action would have led to harmful events. If we performed an action and we were not aware of the possible outcomes and a negative consequence does occur, we're going to excuse responsibility of those because, again, the intent wasn't to do any harm. Third, the subject has to be able to freely choose to act in a certain way. That is, it does not make sense to hold someone responsible for a harmful event if their actions were completely determined by outside forces. We're going to look at these three major conditions a little bit more in depth uh, for this chapter. The casual contribution, person or group to be held morally responsible for a particular event. So what is what must occur first? In order for a person to be held morally responsible for a particular event, again, they must be able to expert some kind of influence on that event. That means they have to, to have a, some type of casual relationship with the event. They did A that resulted in B, for example. It does not make sense to blame someone for an accident if they could not have avoided it. That's another big thing. With computer technology, the ability to obscure some of those casual connections between a person's actions and the actual uh, event or the consequences, they're becoming more complex. Being able to trace the sequence of events that held or led to a computer-related incident, it can take multiple directions, time, and sometimes it's not always a single error, a single point of failure, or a single mishap. It's several things that lead up to a situation. So that's, an, uh, that's one type of consideration to have. Another issue with the casual c contribution is that there may be multiple actors in development or the development of those technologies, which then lead to this concept of many hands. That basically is, there's not a single person that should be held responsible, it should be uh, many people. An example could be the Therac 25 uh, radiation treatment machine. They had a computer controlled device in the 80s that while in its development, it was being developed so uh, it could do treat cancer patients and x-rays of uh, them as well. But uh, mid-80s there was a problem where it accidentally overdosed six patients, which contributed, uh, contributed to their eventual death. Three of them died as a direct result of the radiation overdose, three of them did not. While the incident was the result of a combination of errors, who should be held liable? Uh, there was people that were saying that because it was there was a bad interface within the software design, they should be held responsible. Some were saying that the machinist, the, man, the actual manufacturer of the product, should be held liable. Some said the doctors. So all reality, who should have been held responsible, or should all of them been held responsible? And then to what degree should we do that? The problem with that is if we held everyone responsible within that accident, it does kind of violate one of our uh, conditions. None of them intended for this to happen, so should they be held responsible? And that's one of the problems is should they? 
and everyone's going to have a different opinion on this. One of my favorite is the distance uh, argument. Well, I only operated the computer. The computer controlled the machine. So I should not be held liable because I never directly interfaced with the machine. I only told the computer portion what to do. And that was a stance by several people. But because of the actual physical difference between the computer and the machine, that distance blurred some of that casual connection between the actions of the a technician and the events that led to people's death. Again, that's one example for technology and us disconnecting from it. We live in a post 9-11 world and I'm actually in Nevada and we fly a lot of drones out of one of the Air Force bases here. The drones fly overseas. If a pilot hundreds of miles away, if not thousands of miles away, attacks and kills someone on another continent, is there any morality to that? All they're doing is flying a machine. They don't directly kill anyone. So should they have to deal with any of the consequences of killing someone? Uh, if they do kill someone over there, is it murder? Is it justified? All really good examples when we start talking about the causal relationship between our actions and the outcome consequences. So, next let's talk about considering the consequences. Technology shape how we perceive and experience the world. The second condition of attributing moral responsibility is to make appropriate decisions. A person has to be able to consider consequences and deliberate about those consequences of their actions. So they don't just have to consider, they must be able to think about and understand the consequences of their actions. Uh, there's been numerous trials in the news lately about uh, school shootings, uh, bombings, and whether people were understood what they were doing. They performed an action, but did they understand the consequences of those actions? And this has been a very touchy subject, especially lately, because this is really hard to support or prove. The nice thing is, on one hand, a computer can assist individuals to think through, walk through, or plan through their actions of choice. That way, the user can capture, store, organize, analyze data or information to help support whatever action they're planning to do. So the technology is, a, is being used to actually help consider some of those consequences or outcomes. A big thing here is people must be aware of the possible risk or harm that their actions might cause. It is unfair to hold someone responsible for something they could not have known their actions might lead to. And again, that's going to be very subjective. I throw a lit cigarette out my window and I continue driving down the freeway. I may not know that that cigarette may cause a fire, but I should at least know that there's a possibility that that cigarette, while is lit, if I leave them in bushes or leave them somewhere where they could start a fire, they could start a fire. So should I be held responsible? I should at least, as a consenting adult who's capable, should be aware of all possible risks that my actions may lead to. So in that term, sure, I should be held liable. We have a lot of forest fires where I'm at, and a big cause of that is smokers or people flicking uh, lit items into grass and leaving them. And then their argument normally is, I didn't know that it would cause a fire, but as an adult, you should know 
when you throw a lit match into brush or paper or gas or anything flammable that the risk might be uh, there to start a fire. So that's a, definitely a consideration to have. So how does this actually tie to technology or computer? We, be, we sit behind a keyboard maybe a hundred of miles away between people that we talk to or interact with online. We do or say things online that we may or may not say in person. Should we be held viable or should we deal with the consequences of our actions? Cyberbullying is becoming more and more of an issue and teenagers especially uh, in high school are starting to be either become cyber bullied or become cy uh, cyber bully, uh, bully, bullies. Bullies. <laughs> Not bullies, but bullies. And there is no intent for them to cause harm, but because of the disconnect, well, we only typed online. And that online event then translate into real life. So those are considerations. Uh, that's a very big example that's happening right now uh, because we had a girl that just committed suicide in the school district I am because uh, on her Twitter and on her Facebook and a few of her other social media, a group of friends, or former friends at her high school were starting to bully her, leaving very negative comments. And just a lot of people jumped on that bandwagon that didn't even know her and just left her just these really mean, hurtful messages. And after the fact, uh, several of these teens were approached about why they did it. And most of them had zero concept of the consequences. They knew they would never say that to someone's face, but behind a keyboard, they were a lot more willing to do and say things that otherwise they wouldn't have done. One of my last examples of considering consequences is a more very touchy subject, which is normally online pedophilia or uh, online viewing of child pornography. This is a big one, especially within the technology realm, because uh, many countries have uh, banned any form of child pornography. But in the Philippines, you can uh, actually chat with Filipino girls normally between the ages of 8 and 15 and there are people from other countries that will pay them or solic uh, solicit them to perform acts for payment. One of the big ones is uh, with how easy it is to transfer money PayPal for example or uh, how easy it is to video chat through Skype or other video messages you can now from the US, Britain, most first world countries or industrialized countries go online, go to the uh, websites to find them and pay these Filipino minors to do perform actions that might be illegal in most other countries. Is that wrong? Most people do not dawn on the consequences of their actions Legally, they know that within their country that's illegal, but where the girls are at, that may not be illegal. What's really interesting uh, to help combat this, a uh, specialized group in Australia, they actually uh, created this girl named Sweetie. She's a 3D virtual reality girl uh, who will do video chats and will chat with uh, potential pedophiles to help collect information. That way they never put a minor in jeopardy. They use a computer simulated program to catch these criminals and then uh, once they have enough data collected on them they send them to the appropriate authorities. In the US it's normally the FBI. But that way these pedophiles can be caught and be arrested because they are technically uh, sex trafficking these miners from the Philippines. But that's a huge consideration because this is all due directly to our, how easy our technology has made it. Before we could not easily exploit miners in other countries. Now we can. And it's wrong. 
but how are we going to interact and how are we going to fix that? And that is the, the dilemma. That is, I was very happy that 60 Minute did a very nice uh, special on 3D, because within the first month, they caught over a thousand pedophiles. So that's a huge thing. But the argument has been brought up. Many of these men, sadly that most of them are men, uh, especially within uh, the UK, they were asked, you know, did you understand the consequences of those actions? You solicited the girls online, these minors online, and then uh, some of them solicit minors actually closer, and then it was they actually show up to meet minors. And it was, did you understand the consequences of you showing up? Again, 60 Minute did a, an amazing special on adults that actually end up meeting minors online. Again, normally between 8 and 15. And uh, these men actually have no concept of the consequences of their actions, whether it be legal consequences of meeting the, the minors or consequences of just talking to them or consequences of what items that they've brought to the meeting. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity, 60 Minutes has both of these clips on their website and they are amazing because all of this deals with the morality of our computer age. So I did want to point that out and share that with you guys. Next is going to be free to act. One of the big things is one must have the freedom to act and that is the most important condition. One of the most contested as well. If you performed an action, were you forced to do it? Going back to the child pedof uh, pedophiles, no one forced them to do the actions that they did. So, should they be held? Should they uh, be held fully liable for their actions? They were free to not do what they did. However, they did do it and thus should they be held responsible. Normally we have the tendency to excuse people from moral blame if they had no other choice but to act in the, uh, the situation or that the way that they did. So sometimes it is okay to do something wrong if you had no other choice. But then we would have to then look at, look at choices. I have no food to eat, so I shoplift to steal food. Both were morally wrong. Well, being poor is not morally wrong, but shoplifting is morally wrong. So when you shoplift, to actually eat, is that wrong? And, and that's one of those gray areas. Do the means justify the actions, or do the actions justify the means? If your intentions were noble, but the way that you executed those intentions were not, is the end result worth it? Uh, during World War II, one of the big things that the Nazis did was human experiments. And they were looking to cure certain diseases. And they did cure several diseases. Uh, so we actually have vaccinations now because of Nazi doctors we normally frown upon the action that they did because what they did was wrong but at the same token we actually took their research that they did do we didn't continue it we stopped it Nuremberg trials for scientific uh, research methodology stopped uh, all human experimentation but we already took the knowledge that was gained during those items and we acted on them. We developed cures. We developed vaccinations that ended up helping people. Uh, though, that actually violates one of the more important conditions. Nazis doctors forced inmates to be uh, subjects within, these, uh, within, within this research. So they were not free to act. However, the doctors themselves were free to act. 
And should they be held liable for their actions? They performed a specific action that may have been detrimental to another human being. Should they be held liable? And normally, the general excuse of Nazi doctors were we were just following orders. But there is a point where they were free to act, to do, or to disobey, and deal with consequences. So the free to act portion is very interesting. Within our technology, many things are very simple to do. You can use Google to look up uh, illegal activities. And because it's simple, because you are free to do it, does it make it right? Right now, with probably two or three search terms, you could probably find free movies, free TV shows, uh, free games that weren't made to be free. You could probably find a just recently removed or released uh, theater film through Google to download, so you could watch it from home. It's online piracy because it's easy. People say, well, what's the harm? What, there are no consequences if I do something illegal online. Because, again, our technology is disconnect. We sit behind the com uh, computer, or we sit behind the keyboard, and we are oblivious to our, the consequences of our actions. What you do through the technology, should you be held liable for? And then how do we hold, uh, hold people liable for that? And that's a, a good question because there aren't many things going on right now that a lot of people can agree on, especially with the morality of our technology. Computing, like any other technology, adds additional layers of complexity to determine whether someone is free to act. That is, if they had no choice to do a specific action because of a circumstance. The circumstances could vary. In practice, attributing autonomy of free will to humans on the basis of fulfillment, should that be a, a con uh, condition that is straightforward? What I mean by that is, if you have the free will, but you need to fulfill some type of base condition, should you be held responsible? And then it goes back to that fulfillment. Is it a need or is it a want? To what degree must you fulfill that action? And would fulfilling your action put others in jeopardy? Again, all very good questions that are not very simple. So once we've fulfilled the free to act portion, let's talk about moral agents. What is a moral agent and what does the concept of mor uh, moral agents reflect? Moral responsibility is generally attributed to moral agents, and at least in the Western uh, philosophical world, traditionally, moral agents has been a concept exclusively reserved for humans. Meaning, things like animals or disasters cannot be moral agents. A human being, in the traditional uh, sense, can be the originator of moral significant actions, as they can freely choose to act in one way rather than another way, and deliberately uh, deliberate about consequences of their choice. Uh, animals, uh, natural disaster or disasters or accidents, none of them normally have the ability to make choice. Not just make choice, but deliberate about the consequences or outcomes of those choices. There are some people that are inclined uh, that computers uh, and treat them as a moral agent. Computers, as it is right now, currently do not understand choice or morality the same way a human does. Uh, a computer may be able to make choices based off of probability or based off of certain criteria, but can they deliberate about the consequences or outcomes of their choice and then truly understand thereof? 
Uh, there's been a big debate about technology and if they could be called moral agents. And the limitation of the traditional ethical uh, vocabulary and thinking about the moral decision of computing have led to some authors to rethink the basic concept of moral agent. Because again, moral agent normally is reserved for humans. But, what about computers? as a moral responsible agent. Things like AI or higher order intentional computer systems or even robots. AI have the ability to make decisions based off of certain criteria and then they can compute uh, outcome or consequences of choice but then are they free? That's another thing is are they free to make either option or make additional options as uh, outside of their scope of programming? Because right now we're looking at choices and free, uh, the act of freedom. Can a AI that has not been programmed for specific criteria or for specific choices can elevate their programming in such a way where they can then make decisions that aren't uh, pre-programmed. And that's one of the problems. What about higher order intentional computer systems? Again, same dilemma. Robots. Uh, adaptive robotics where they are where they have the ability to learn or adapt to situations but to what degree can they understand or learn or deliberate about consequences of actions. That's been another really big one. Uh, just because with AI and with robots, does uh, personhood, hmm, that's a weird word, personhood, does a moral agent require personhood? Computer systems, or more specifically robots, could be moral agents when they have the significant level of autonomy and they can be regarded as opportunity level of obstruction as exhibited by in intentional behavior. Meaning, behavior that's not pre-programmed. Intentional behavior is action is based off of free will or reaction is based off of circumstance. So that's one of the major items here for those seeking to reclassify moral agents to include computers. What about autonomous moral agents? What does the future hold? One of the big things that's been uh, buzzing around right now are these things called autonomous moral agents, AMAs, and they would have the capability of reasoning about the moral and social significance of their behavior and the, the use their assessment of the effects of their behavior on sentient beings to make the appropriate choices. Sentient. Sentient. Sorry about that. Sentient beings to make appropriate choices. So they would be able to look at actions to deliberate about consequences or possible outcomes of actions, reflect on the moral and social significance of their actions and possible outcomes, and then they'd be able to apply that effect to sentient beings, thus allowing them to make the appropriate choice. There is research done in 2006 to 2011 that outlines all of this and this is becoming something that's coming to the forefront for our definitions of morality and ethics and what we understand for decision making. In the effort to build uh, AMAs rise the question of how this effort affects the description of moral responsibility. Can we pass on responsibility to something that isn't sentient? Could we have a computer system 
that truly takes on the responsibility of a human being. And then not just hold them accountable, but also hold them responsible. So now let's expand the concept of moral agents. Because of these questions, more recent years in the last five years, different approaches have been developed. Many propose to extend the class of moral agents to include AI. Disconnect, disconnecting moral agents and moral accountability from the notion of moral responsibility. So accountability is holding one accountable for actions versus moral responsibility. Responsibility is not the same as accountability. Contending that insurmountable difficulty of the traditional and now rather outdated views that a human can be found accountable and only a human can found accountable, artificial agents should be acknowledged as moral agents that can be held accountable, but again, not responsible. Because now systems can, can uh, whether they be AI or programmed systems, should be able to be held accountable for the acts that they do. But are they responsible for the acts that they do? Or should the person that's programmed them or began this process be held responsible for those artificial agents being doing whatever task that they do? For example, we launch a malware program that will infect another country's power system. We programmed a artificial agent to release that malware. We then leave it alone. Years go by and nothing happens. One day, that malware finds its way into the appropriate system and then executes. The system should be held accountable for the action that it's done. But should the creator or the person that's releasing the malware be responsible for the artificial agents and what, they're at, what, they, what they've done? So we hold the system accountable, but we hold the initiator responsible. The advantage of disconnecting accountability from responsibility is that it places the focus of moral agenthood, accountability and census, instead on figuring out which human agents are responsible, we are less likely to, to assign responsibility at any cost, forced by the necessity of inter, uh, identifying human moral agents. We can liberate technology development of the artificial agents from being bound by the, standard, uh, the standard limiting views. When an artificial agent behaves badly, they can be dealt with directly when their autonomous behavior and complexity makes it too difficult to disrupt responsibility among those human agents. Immoral agents can be modified or deleted. It is then the responsibility of the attribute moral accountability even when moral responsibility cannot be determined. Meaning. We can always remove systems that may not be functioning correctly. Once a system is seen to be uh, held accountable for their actions, we can remove them, delete them, get rid of them. For example, Apple, so this is somewhat of a far stretch, but I, I do like this analogy. Apple had a app where you could download it on iTunes if you tipped your iPhone over, it'd be like pouring a beer. They acknowledge that that held no educational purpose whatsoever. So they held the app accountable for its intent purpose. It was then deleted. Even though the person that created it was never held responsible for the creation of the app, they held the app accountable for the way it was created. It served no purpose, so it was able to get rid of it. Thus allowing a little easier ability to remove the app, 
Otherwise, they would have to find the, the appropriate person that was responsible for creating the app, punishing them, and then having them remove the app. That can get really complex within our current technology and future technology. A common saying is to say that technology are not moral agents. It is not to say that they are not part of the moral action. Several philosophers have stressed that moral responsibility cannot be properly understood without recognizing the activity role or the active role of technology in shaping our action. It is through our technology that shapes our views, our cultural and our social understanding, and then through that our morality can be defined. The technology artifacts or artificial uh, intelligence alone may not be viewed as moral agents, but building upon other works done in 2008 and 2009, moral agents have ever have really ever truly been pure or purely human. Moral agents generally in involve some type of uh, artificial uh, or artifact that shapes our behavior whether it be through our current technology or previous technology of certain times, often in the way not anticipated by the designer. For example, um, computers coming out 50s, 60s, 70s, they never would have thought that the internet would evolve to the way where we can now purchase drugs online. So should we be able to hold those creators accountable? No, the in original design of the internet is not our current internet view now. It's been adapted and developed. So situations have to be taken into account. So lastly, rethinking the concept of moral responsibility. One approach to rethinking moral responsibility is assigned uh, which is normally that humans have the uh, tendency to sidestep or avoid responsibility by trying to blame one, someone else. One of the major misconceptions is computing is ethical neutral practice. The technology doesn't do anything unethically. We order the technology or we tell the technology to do something and then it performs action regardless if it views it as ethic ethically or not. Then the second misconception is responsibility is only about determining the blame when something goes wrong. Again, we've already discussed, it is to blame or to praise an individual or group based off of voluntary actions. In the light of all of these new difficult ascribing moral responsibilities, there have been several papers developed that critique the way that our concept of morality and how it's interpreted in the relation, uh, relationship uh, to technology and computing is defined. The traditional model or framework for dealing with moral responsibility currently falls short and proposes different perspectives or interpretations to address some of these difficulties. One of the major approaches is on moral responsibility is, ass is assigned. That is, again, our misconceptions. Us sidestepping. Us placing the blame on someone else or looking for someone else to place the blame. Not taking responsibility for our actions and then allowing us to get away with our actions. So that's been a huge uh, rethinking of our concept of moral responsibility. Is that appropriate? There's a distinction between positive and neg negative responsibilities underline the holding someone morally responsible has a function, which provides yet another perspective on the issue. Respectively and retroactively, responsibility works to organize social relations between people and groups and between people and institutions. It sets the expectations between everyone individually and group for the fulfillment of certain obligations and duties and provides the means to correct, encourage, 
certain behavior. That way, if as a group, as a society, as a culture, we find an action to be intolerable, unmoral, we have the framework, we have a way, some type of maybe de facto, non-standardized form of correction. That way we can either adapt to that new circumstance or do corrective uh, changes so that circumstance then becomes more morally acceptable. The distinction between is very important. It is not to eliminate, it is corrective action first and foremost. If something is morally viewed as negative, as a whole our society will or our culture may push away from it. However, as it gains acceptance or as people start viewing it as more acceptable, our moral stance may change. And that's actually really it for this week. So I wanted to thank you guys. I have a little bit coming up on our follow-up, but that was our discussion on moral responsibility and technology. If you guys want to read a really good article, it's by Coleman. It was written in 2004. Sorry, it was first written in 2004, but there are several updated versions of it. It's titled Computing and Moral Responsibility, and this is a really great article. I wanted to thank you. Okay, so I wanted to discuss some follow-up items. One of the first things is our APA formatting and citation. That goes for both our IPs and our discussions. Remember that we have to do all of our work according to APA manual. So if you're not sure how to do that, go online. Uh, you can type in APA formatting. Uh, if you don't want to look it up online, you can go to any of the tutorial services. We have a writing, we have a library service. They can give you additional resources on how to do APA formatting. That's important. That's not going away. Uh, in discussions, same thing. We have to be doing our citations in our discussions because one of the big things is for our citations, we're building off of other people's works. So it's a way for us to verify what we're claiming is supported by the literature. So when I say something at the sky is blue, you can take my word for it, or if I provide a citation, you can take an expert's word for it, and then I built off of that. So it just kind of increases your credibility. We should be at least citing in every uh, post or as much as possible. Because again, we're trying to link what we've done back to the literature. Same thing in our IPs. Every paragraph should be uh, tied to a source. Every paragraph is an idea. And every idea we need to have support within the literature. And I know at this level it's not that big of an issue, but you want to get in the habit of doing that so when you start doing higher level work, it's second nature. Also, length. We don't need posts that are great job. I mean, don't get me wrong, it does add to it, but when I start grading for posts, I'm not doing uh, full credit for those that have three posts and two of them are great jobs. I don't count the great jobs as a post. For our discussion board, I'm looking for three solid responses with citations. Uh, for our papers, I'm looking for three pages of content with citations. So what I mean by content is that's three papers on topic. That's not a cover page, that's not your reference page, that's three content pages. Uh, two if you're really good, but I'm really looking for three. 
if you're doing uh, diagrams. Diagrams totally are okay, as long as you're doing them within APA formatting. Lastly, grading. Again, I grade off of heavily off of attempt, like if you're putting an effort into it. Like if you did two pages and you did a few citations and I could see that you were making an effort, I'll, I'll meet you. But if you post once or you did a page and a half with one citation, you know, that really isn't you making an effort. Uh, if you get stuck, don't get me wrong, some people a page is a lot. If you get stuck, you have plenty of resources to bolster up your paper. You can contact me, I'll help you. If you don't want to contact me, we have a writing uh, center, we have a tutorial, uh, tutorial center, we have plenty of help for you to get. If you need tutoring, there's a lot of tutoring out there. And uh, again, provided from the school. All you have to do is say something. For our tutorial lab, we have tutor uh, tutorial services for SQL, we have tutorial services for database, we have tutorial services for math, English, writing, research, library services. I mean, we have a great amount of tutorial services. And if we don't offer tutoring in a specific area, you can ask for it specifically, and they will find tutors for you. So you cannot use, you cannot get tutoring, because you can. If you ask for help, the school will get it. If you cannot get it from the school, there's other help. I will sit down with you. I will do as much as, as, much as I can with you if you need one-on-one. -on -one. If you need tutoring and you don't get tutoring, that's not a failure on my part. That's not a failure on the school's part. That's only a failure on your part because there's plenty of opportunities there. You have my number. You have my email. You have two emails from me. You have my cell phone number. You have plenty of ways to get a hold of me if you need help. And again, if you don't capitalize on help and you need help, that's on you. That's on you. Okay, there's plenty of help out there. All you have to do is say something. Thank you.